Finns love to celebrate whenever our country or culture is mentioned in foreign media, which is why it's surprising how little it is emphasized that Middle Earth is basically Finnish. Well, at least largely inspired by Finnish mythology. The uniqueness and the brutal side of the Finnish myths had a huge influence on Professor Tolkien and his work in fiction. And since the disappointingly below mediocre Rings of Power is now evoking discussion on the Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth and Tolkien's Legendarium, let's meet at the market square and see which Finnish myths have influenced Tolkien's world and Middle Earth. Obviously, some of the influences are easier to spot than others, so I'm not going to list every similarity I can think of. Also, several ingredients in Tolkien's soup can be found not only in Finnish myths but across Northern Europe or the world. Moreover, we know that Tolkien read the Kalevala, Finland's national epic, but wasn't necessarily familiar with other versions of old Finnish tales. This video is not going to include the most common, boring comparisons like Gandalf being Väinämöinen. Besides the sage Väinämöinen, Gandalf was inspired by several other mythical heroes from Europe. My list is by no means complete, and if you notice something missing, I would love to see your thoughts and prayers in the comments. Let's go! Well, I mentioned Väinämöinen, so the guy cannot go unaddressed now. The more obvious counterpart than Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings is of course everyone's favorite, Tom Bombadil himself. Bombadil is a mysterious figure who has been around since the beginning of times. He is much like Väinämöinen, who in some runes takes part in the creation of the world itself. He is often thought to be the most powerful being in Middle-earth after Sauron in The Lord of the Rings, while Väinämöinen is perhaps the most powerful character in Kalevala. Both of them can control nature with their singing, which Bombadil uses to save Frodo and the other hobbits in the Fellowship of the Ring. Reciting powerful runes by singing plays a major role in Kalevala, and Väinämöinen is a master of this art. The god in Tolkien's universe is called Eru Iluvata. Now, if we change a few letters, we can see where the name clearly comes from. Ilmatar, spirit of the air, begins the process of the creation of the world in the Kalevala. The creation, as told in the Silmarillion, starts from pretty much nothing, an empty void, very much like in Kalevala. Of course, Iluvatar is a counterpart of the Christian god, as Tolkien was Catholic himself, which makes the fusion of the Bible with heathen runes in order to create a supreme god in his fictional world rather amusing. In Kalevala, the heroes attempt to court the beautiful daughter of the North. In order to gain the parents' acceptance, they have to complete impossible, dangerous tasks. In Tolkien's world, the mortal man Beren has to fetch one of the gems called the Silmarils from the Dark Lord Morgoth's Iron Crown and present it as bride prize. For the creation of the elven language of Quenya, Tolkien used old poetic Finnish as a starting point. The language, just like Finnish, is loaded with suffixes. Even the pronunciation is similar to Finnish. Moreover, the name of the language itself could derive from the Quens, an old word for historical and mythical inhabitants of regions of modern-day Finland. Ilmarinen was likely an ancient Finnish god of the skies, but in the later centuries became a heroic blacksmith. In the Kalevala, he gets credit for forging the sun and moon, just like Aule in Tolkien's world. As if the sun and moon wouldn't be enough for one smith's resume, Ilmarinen goes on to forge the Sambo, a magical instrument that brings prosperity to its owner. Sambo is a key motive in the Kalevala and gets stolen and fought over and is ultimately lost. Does that sound familiar? Sambo-like motives in Tolkien's universe include the Silmarils, the magical gems forged by Feanor, an ancient elven craftsman. They also get stolen, fought over and lost. 
Besides the Silmarils, the One Ring is a very similar motif to the Sampo. It gives immense power to its owner, gets fought over and ultimately destroyed. The realm of Angband, fortress of Morgoth, the big bad guy and Sauron's master, has a lot of similarities to Pohjola, evil northern realm in Kalevala, as suggested by Anu Vehkomäki in her thesis. Both are cold, remote and evil places where no one goes without good reason and great risk. They are ruled by evil sorcerers, Lohi and Morgoth, and guarded by beasts and monsters. The entire Kalevala is written in an ancient runic measure, and the poems were recited by singing. Not surprisingly, The Lord of the Rings contains countless pages of singing. Divine music also plays a central part in the creation of the world, both in Kalevala as well as Middle-earth. Just like Gandalf gets rescued by the eagle Gwaihir, Väinämöinen gets saved by an eagle after being shot at and almost drowned in the sea. Neither of them casually summon the eagle as an easy way to get out of trouble. The eagles are beings with a will of their own and sometimes choose to help out the heroes when they happen to be around. The darkest of Tolkien's stories is that of Turin, which is no wonder since it's basically a retelling of the Finnish story of Kullervo. Turin's story has none of the adventurous spirit of The Hobbit, nor the positivity of The Lord of the Rings. Just like Kullervo's story, it is extremely tragic, with an anti-hero cursed since his birth. The heroes go on, trying to escape the curse, only to end up causing death and destruction wherever they go, accidentally committing incest with their sisters, who then kill themselves, and finally committing suicide by their own talking swords. Just like the heroes and elves departing from the Grey Havens at the end of The Lord of the Rings, so does Väinämöinen. They depart our world and may never be seen again, as the sea voyage symbolizes the end. Which brings us to the end of this video. With his work, Tolkien wanted to give England its own Kalevala, a collection of national myths that had not been preserved other than Celtic tales. And given how popular his work has become, I think it is fair to say that he did all right. Or even beyond that, as his legendarium is enjoyed by people not only in England, but pretty much everywhere. Were there are some influences of Finnish myths that I didn't mention? Share your thoughts and prayers in the comments. And if videos like this and Finnish mythology are close to your heart, check out my other videos or even consider subscribing to the channel.